The island of Malta is situated in the middle of the Mediterranean and is a beautiful and much visited holiday destination for millions of people every year who come to enjoy its beauty, sunshine and friendly inhabitants. However, the many people who choose to vacation in Malta, most are unaware of the country's numerous and spectacular ancient monuments, which are some of the most impressive archaeological sites outside of Egypt, both in terms of scale and antiquity. What makes the megalithic temples and ancient tunnel systems of Malta so intriguing is their construction, as told within Maltese folklore, is attributed to a race of giants, giants who were the original inhabitants of Malta and its surrounding islands. While stories of ancient giants exist all over the world, in Malta there is actual hard evidence for this in terms of the scale of the ancient monuments themselves as well as within the surviving artwork with its origins of the dark antiquity of this remarkable island nation. Welcome to Malta, the land of the ancient giants. According to Maltese and Sicilian folklore, there was a race of giants living on the island of Malta for a very long time before the first migrants crossed the sea from Sicily. We now know that the first human settlement in Malta occurred during the Neolithic era, approximately 5,000 years ago. Maltese folklore also tells us that when these migrants arrived the island was alleged to have been not only populated by a race of giants, but that these giants were also responsible for the construction of the many impressive megalithic structures dotted among the Maltese islands. This brings up a number of questions. Firstly, just how old are the ancient structures themselves? The underground complexes, the megalithic sites and temples, as well as the cave systems in Malta. And also, just what kind of humanoid were these so-called giants in actuality? Were they modern homo sapiens? And was the term giant purely an allegory for their ability to build these megaliths? Or did they come from an extinct genus, Gigantopithecus? Finally, as we also see in the Mediterranean with Sardinia, and far off in the South Pacific with Easter Island, why is it that islands are associated with tales of giants, or have left gigantic and numerous megalithic and other structures that seem completely out of proportion with the size and limited natural resources and sustainable populations of these small islands? On the southeastern coast of Malta, adjacent to St. George's Bay, is the caves at the country's oldest prehistoric site of Garda Lam. The cave at Garda Lam was found to contain the bones of long extinct animals when first excavated in the 19th century. Among these millions of bones of numerous species was discovered pygmy elephants and hippopotami. These were determined to have been deposited inside the caves around half a million years ago. According to archaeologists, large numbers of different species were also later deposited in different layers according to the timelines. However, when one examines the cave at the floor level, 
the different historical layers all appear to be within approximately the same or a very close proximity to each other layer to the point where one layer seems almost indistinguishable in terms of depth from another. It also seems more likely that some natural cataclysm resulted in the corpses of these animals being washed into the cave which itself is at the bottom of a valley at Gardalam, almost akin to a clogged plug hole on a kitchen sink. Mixed in with the so-called layers was volcanic ash and the bones of some unidentified species of human. At this point, the story takes an interesting turn. The discovery of the human remains within the cave at Gar the Lamb, even using the most conservative estimates, determined them to be several thousand years older than what was believed to be the period when the first arrival of human migration to Malta occurred during the Neolithic. This is where things become rather strange. These human bones which should have been considered an archaeological sensation around the world at the time, were treated as no more than a curiosity and filed away with all the other discoveries. The bones belonging to these unknown humanoid skeletons then went missing from the cave exhibit room during the Second World War and have apparently been lost forever. So therefore confirming if the bones within guard the lamb are of a Neanderthal or some other species of human, will never be determined unless similar samples turn up somewhere else on the island. And this may be possible in the future as the island of Malta is covered in known lost and yet to be discovered systems of caves. Another interesting factor is that the public are only allowed limited access to guard the lamb, similar to the absolutely spectacular underground complex of the Hypergeum Hal Sapolini. Public access is strictly controlled, and what lies ahead in the darkness, beyond the security personnel, lights and fencing, is strictly off limits to the public. Guard the lamb is important in not only does it prove that some species of humanoid were in fact living in Malta within the distant past beyond that of the Neolithic arrivals? But we are also given an insight into the strange and limited narrative of the archaeological and historical bodies which have overseen the excavation and public image of Malta's ancient sites have presented to us. One gets the feeling that much is being deliberately hidden, yet what is not hidden tends to be editorialized away with a narrative often at odds with what the evidence presents to us before our very eyes. The beginning of the 20th century was a period of tremendous archaeological revelations unearthed in Malta, starting with the discovery of the remarkable and mysterious underground complex of the Hal Sapolini Hypogeum, a raising of ancient consciousness and self-identity among the Maltese people began to take root within the national image. This led to new discoveries of immense importance, including the nearby Tarjan temples, when after years of having their ploughs caught on stone blocks under the soil, local farmers contacted the then director of the National Museum, Themistocles Zamet.
From 1920 onwards, Zamet oversaw the massive excavation project of the Tarjean site, revealing a vast and complex temple which had been lost for at least 5,000 years. Uncovered were five interconnected structures made up of large stone vertical blocks, and more importantly, a vast collection of ancient stone artwork and carvings, which revealed to us the life and appearance of the people who built these remarkable structures. Many of these artworks contained spiral motifs of very highly skilled levels of masonry, displaying a proficiency of artistic elegance and even flair far in advance of the other examples of Neolithic rock art carvings found around Europe from a similar period. Among the discoveries included the famous Fat Lady statue, believed to have been a representation of the Mother Goddess. The female figure, of which many other types have been found in Malta, far from being depicted naked or in a basic animal skin attire, shows these ancient individuals wearing high quality clothing, including pleated skirts and braided hairstyles. Yet today, at all of the official archaeological sites in Malta, the academic illustrations present us with images of the people who built the complex at Targin and other locations as wearing primitive animal skins. And yet, the statues and figures they left behind are of well-dressed, large and tall individuals. Of all the objects found at Targin and other Maltese archaeological sites, and which remain cryptic to this day, are the enormous urns or cauldrons carved from single pieces of stone with remarkable precision. The official archaeological statement concerning these massive stone vessels is that they were used for the collection of the blood from ritually sacrificed humans and animals. Yet, there is absolutely not a single shred of evidence to support this, other than prejudice against ancient people and their ways. However, what there is evidence for is that these stone containers were clearly designed to be lifted up by a single individual, as they are complete with handles on the sides designed for this very purpose. Judging by the size of these stone vessels, it has been estimated that an individual weighing approximately a thousand pounds and standing ten feet tall would be required to lift the container of this size in order to transport it from one place to another. This is also indicative of the scale of some of the artwork at Targin and other Maltese sites. For example, the spiral motifs carved into the stone is not only far more sophisticated than what we have come to see in the rest of Europe at the same time, but also the spirals themselves are larger and wider, as if larger hands created them. Here we can see the intricacy and precision the carvings are on a monumental scale, while some of these spiral carvings here in Malta are created with a flush corner. This, there's also a second school, which appears to be more of a beveled edge on the spirals. Again, the scale is large, it's monumental. It's not meant to be viewed from a distance, because we know that these monuments were close up and on the ground.
Why is it that all over the world, from Malta to Sardinia, from Lundy Island off the coast of England to Tory Island off the coast of Ireland, are tales of giants often connected to small islands? Why, for example, were the famous Moai figures of remote Easter Island in the South Pacific created so colossal in scale and on such a small remote island? Within Homer's Odyssey, the giant Polyphemus, who incidentally was also the son of the sea god Poseidon, resided on an island in the Mediterranean. This almost universal idea of the presence of giants living upon islands makes little sense in terms of giants requiring more natural resources so as to survive when resources are scarcer on islands when compared to larger land masses such as continents. While there are tales of giants living in places such as North America and Central Europe, Unlike the stories of giants living on islands such as Malta, they are not imbued with the same sense of cultural reinforcement, nor are they connected to large and ancient megalithic structures to the same degree of which they are in places such as Malta and Sardinia. So this leaves us with one other aspect as to why the proliferation of mythology concerning giants and islands, and that is easier access to the sea, where resources are abundant. So this leads to the question, were the giants of the ancient past out of necessity forced to become semi-aquatic towards the end of their presence upon the earth? And did Neolithic Homo sapiens witness this final age of the giants? This is the temple of Gigantia, literally meaning temple of the giants, a megalithic complex on the tiny Maltese Mediterranean island of Gozo. According to official historians, the temple of Gigantia was constructed during the Neolithic era, or around 5,000 years ago. Even to the casual visitor, the weathering on the monolith seems incredibly ancient. How archaeologists age such monuments is determined by means of lifting up the stones and then carbon dating the organic material trapped underneath them. Although this technique strives to date the age when the first stones were laid down, it has been shown to be highly problematic, as everything from burrowing rabbits to earthworms can move the soil underneath the stones, making an accurate dating of them near impossible. The temple of Gigantia is also noteworthy in that it appears far more heavily eroded by the elements than the other Maltese megaliths, even though it is more naturally protected from the elements as it is neither on top of a hill nor next to the coast, as in the case of the Hagar Quim complex, which is now underneath a large canopy to protect it from natural forces of wind and water erosion. So therefore, assuming that the megalithic temple of Gigantia is the oldest of the Maltese ancient sites, and even mainstream academics agree it is, then why is it so strongly connected 
to the tales of giants living on the Maltese islands. According to Maltese folklore, there are several tales involving the relationship of normal sized humans and giants which tend to have a common theme around food consumption. A giant is tricked into eating too much so it becomes sluggish and easier to kill, being a very common tale. This makes sense as a human of say 10 feet tall would have greater mobility issues as well as less stress upon their internal organs when compared to an average size human, especially if the giant's stomach is well filled. Except that is, in one particular environment. The sea. Within the Vedic texts of ancient India, most notably the Ramayama and the Mahabharata, it is recalled that the giants were destroyed in a cataclysmic event. When one considers that such texts are at least 10,000 years old, then this puts them close to the period of history many alternative researchers and authors believe that a major cataclysm took place, which ostensibly reset what was then something of an advanced global culture back to a more primitive condition. The nature of this global cataclysm is still elusive. Some have speculated, such as Emmanuel Velikovsky, in a seminal work Worlds in Motion, that a planet came into the inner solar system throwing the Earth off its orbital axis around the Sun, moving the Earth into a different position within the solar system than it had previously been. Velikovsky also maintained that this devastating experience made its way into folklore and mythology of the ancient world. Hence, the endless and universal stories of major floods, land shifting, changes in sea level, as well as astronomical anomalies recorded in stories and legends from all over the world. However, this is merely one of several possible causes of the purported ancient cataclysm. Other theories have ranged from asteroid or comet impacts to a sudden mass ejection of particles and energy from the sun, which somehow destroyed this ancient global civilization. However, the evidence of the massive worldwide catastrophe from about 10,000 BC can be found all over the world. The thousands of bones found at the base of the Gardalam caves in Malta, for example, are almost certainly the result of a tsunami which took place in the Mediterranean. In 2016, I delivered a lecture in Houston, Texas on the megalithic culture of Sardinia, which is also strongly connected to a race of giants known as the Nuragic culture, a civilization credited with building the colossal and numerous megalithic structures upon that island. Although the Nuragic culture itself is generally associated with the much later Bronze Age, there is a possibility that some giants may have even managed to survive the ancient global disaster and remained in Sardinia for much longer than they had done so in other parts of the world. Another interesting aspect is that the current human population of Sardinia has the highest concentration of proto-European DNA of anywhere in Europe, 
remaining in the wake of the Indo-European invasion. This suggests that Sardinia was isolated from the rest of the world for a very long time, keeping all its secrets to itself. And again, Sardinia is an island with the sea never far away. What if this ancient cataclysmic event which befell the Earth drastically changed the nature of gravity upon the planet? In that, gravity became a much stronger force than it had been during an age when giant humans, and for that matter large animals such as the mammoth and the Irish elk, flourished due to the lighter gravity being favourable to their enormous size and weight. If the gravitational force of the Earth did become stronger, and assuming it happened over a period of many years, then smaller humans such as Homo sapiens would have coped far better with the increased load upon their bodies compared to that of larger humans and animals, which would not have been able to deal with these changes as effectively. The result being that as gravity increased, the giants were unable to compete with the Homo sapiens. Increased gravity not only means more energy required to perform the same tasks, but also would have placed enormous stress upon the body. Internal organs would have been continually and slowly crushed as the gravity increased. Body weight would have shifted to the lower parts of the anatomy. Sleeping on one's back would have made breathing far more difficult, resulting in giants having to sleep on their sides so as not to suffocate while in their sleep. Conversely, the Homo sapiens, who would have been in a far more effective position to become the dominant human on the earth, while the giants would have become easier prey for the land predators. And it must be said, hostile groups of Homo sapiens getting their hands on the resources of the giants who would have found it increasingly impossible to fight back due to their burdensome body weight leading to fatigue and lack of muscular strength. One of the locations where the giants would have found solace from the stronger levels of gravity would have been the buoyancy offered by flotation along coastal areas. Even so, the giants would still have to come onto land during storms and when sharks would have been present. Again, this would have only made them more vulnerable to land animals such as tigers and other predators. Therefore, islands would have provided the safest sanctuary of all for the giants in a world of stronger gravity. There would have been an absence of dangerous predators as well as incursions by any marauding Homo sapiens. From this point of view, Malta would have been ideal in this regard. Remote from the mainland of Europe and Africa. A stable and warm climate. Vast marine and somewhat plentiful land resources. As well as a place to come ashore for periods of time in safety and seclusion. To venerate their gods at their massive stone temples. As well as to find ways to survive in a world that had made them increasingly vulnerable. There is one more intriguing aspect to this story, and that is a possible alternative purpose for the underground hypogeum at Hal Sapalini. Having visited this incredible ancient site myself in 2015, I was struck by an overwhelming sense of sadness and loss I found hard to put my finger upon. This vast and beautiful ancient complex seemed more akin to a demarcation point between this world and the inner earth. Its chambers and walls are saturated with a sense of the sacred as well as the melancholy. Indeed, at the end of the tour one is taken to a location 
which for all intents and purposes looks like a dock where one might take a boat into the inner earth through the vast water filled subterranean tunnels and cave systems under Malta. Was the interior of the earth the final abode of the giants of Malta? During the initial excavations of the Hypogeum Hal Safalini in the early part of the 20th century, one of the most famous artworks of the ancient world was unearthed, a small statuette of what became known as the Sleeping Lady, a clay figurine taught to represent a mother goddess. Apart from her wearing fine quality clothes from an era in which academics still maintain only animal skins were worn, she is lying on her side. Is she sleeping or is she dying? Was this artwork created by the first humans to arrive in Malta, who came face to face with the giants who were nearing their own extinction? We know from Maltese folklore that the first arrivals to come to the island maintained that they merely inherited the great megaliths and temples from the giants who were already living there. Did the Neolithic arrivals from Sicily develop something of a fondness for the declining giant population? Or at least, the ones who have not passed through the ceremonial portal of the Hypogeum Hal Sapolini and into the inner core of the earth. The ones too old to live, possibly being cared for by the new arrivals. We can only speculate. Behind me here is the sleeping lady. It was found in a hypogeum house of the lady, dated of 3,000 years BC. What I see is a sympathetic portrait of a giant in repose, treated with almost an element of loving care, as if she was the last of her kind. Are we in fact looking at the last giant of Malta?